laborers. These laborers are his disciples. These laborers are those who are going to spend eternity with him because they're obedient to his voice and to his call. These laborers don't belong to themselves anymore. They are slaves to God, and that's not a bad thing. I know the word slave has a negative connotation, but as it relates to being a slave to God, it should be your heart's desire that, God, I only want to do what you desire me to do because the only thing I am capable of is messing up my life. The only thing I am capable of is going after things in my own understanding and in my own ways, but the Word of God says that His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. So there's a way that seems right to you, but God's way is so much higher than ours and we have to be willing to be obedient to him and there needs to be a radical transformation that happens in our lives. Now, if some of you were, if you were to go out of town to a town that you've never been to before and you did not have access to GPS or to maps, you would call the friend that you have in that town and you would begin to ask them for directions, okay? And what they would say to you is, where are you? Okay, and if you've never been there, you really don't know where you are. You have to start looking around at different landmarks and the things that you see and say, okay, uh, here's where I am. I see a Chase Bank right here and there's a Taco Bell up the street a little bit. How many of you have ever been in that situation? that you've had to call a friend and explain what you saw so that they can then pull you into where they were, okay? That's exactly where we are right now. We can't afford to miss heaven. It's a beautiful thing that you're alive right now. You should praise God for the opportunity to be hearing his word and have not entered into e the wrong eternity because eternity is long and we don't want to enter into the wrong side of eternity. And right now we're all living in his grace and in his mercy. But we need to uh, sometimes stop and recalculate, okay? Uh, just like uh, reroute, rather. Just like your GPS things do every once in a while when you make a, a wrong turn. It says rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. We need to pray to God that we're not going the way that just seems right. And we need to be rerouted. So just like your friend will begin to ask you some questions like, what do you see? Okay, what, what do you see? What's to your north? What's to your east? What do you see? God has been asking us some questions through these sermons that he's been delivering to us. And I'm going to go through a few of these questions to get us into the word that he has for us today. So the first question he began to ask us is this, is obeying God a urgent priority? So as we redirect our lives towards eternity, we need to come to grips with this question. You need to ask yourself this question. Is obeying God an urgent priority in your life? Because if it's not, you're going to go the way that seems right. Because if we're not obeying his way, we're doing what we want to do. And if it's not urgent that we obey him, then it's not urgent that we hear from him. It's not urgent that we pray. It's not urgent that we read the word. There must be an urgency. I, I wish I could relate to you. No, I will relate to you by revelation the importance of hearing the words that I'm saying this morning because only a few people are going to heaven. Do you hear what I'm saying? A few a few people will actually make it. And the word of God says that the righteous barely make it. It's like, it's like if your house caught on fire uh, upstairs and you had to run downstairs and you can't hardly see and, it's, and you're smoking and coughing and then finally you run to, toward the, fr the, the front door but the front door is already on fire and you burst through the front door that's on fire, that's how people make it into heaven. And that's the Word of God. And that's how the Word of God explains it. So some of you might say, well, as the disciples said, well, who then can be saved? Well, Jesus said this, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Can you say with God? Say this with me. I will make it to heaven with God. That's the whole point of church. That's the whole point of hearing his word so that you can do things with God and not without him. So I pray that you have ears to hear what he's saying. So the question that I have to ask you this morning is, 
is obeying God an urgent priority, okay? And then God gave us some messages along those lines. So I preached a message called, For Such a Time as This, all right? Uh, um, Esther had to obey God and go to the king, even though it was going to cost her her life potentially, but her obedience to God saved a whole nation. It was urgent that she obeyed God. And her uncle told her, listen, maybe you were born for such a time as this. And so she said this. She got an urgency. Can you say urgency? She got an urgency in her spirit and says, you know what? I'm going to see the king. And if I die, I die. That's the kind of urgency we have to live with. But listen, you don't have to create it on your own. If you allow God to live inside your heart, it will be uh, conditioned for, uh, for you to have that urgency as well. Because when Jesus lived here, he said that I must be about my father's business. And if he's going to live in us and we're going to become one with Jesus, then we'll have the same attitude and same mind and same heart that he has to be urgently about my father's business. Listen, this life, if you're saved right now, this life doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the one who saved you. So we must have an urgency to say, God, my life does not belong to me. I give it to you. Do you want to know the best way to lose your life after you have found it is this. The word of God says that those that seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you will find it. Amen. Then I preached the message called, I must urgently be about my father's business. And we just talked to that about that. Then I preached another message called the favor factor. How many remember the favor factor? It was this. It was that if we're willing and obedient to the voice of God, he will bless our life in such a way that people will look at us and say, is that you? What happened? Why do you have so much joy? Why do you have so much peace? Why is God blessing you hand over foot? What is happening in your life? And you'll be able to testify that the favor of God is upon me because I am obedient. I am urgently about my father's business. So the way to, be, to live a blessed life is to be urgently about your father's business. And the blessed life comes from the favor that God puts upon us when we do that. And, and Jesus, once he was corrected by his mother for being three days behind the camp, uh, it said that he humbled himself to uh, his parents and he obeyed them. And then he grew in favor and he grew in stature as well. The next message that we pre I preached was a sinner's worth. We need to urgently see how much a sinner is worth. And a sinner is worth the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, then there's another question that we have to ask ourselves as it relates to being employed by God, because that, that's, that's one of the reasons he saved us. He didn't just save you so that you can miss hell. He also saved you so other people can miss hell. He saved you to be an ambassador, a messenger, to tell people about God's goodness, okay? Uh, so we begin speaking about a sinner's worth, and the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Are sinners worth saving? And your answer should be an overwhelming yes, especially if he saved you. Amen? So now that brings us to our next question and uh, will get us into the next, the, the message that we have today. So the question that God has us, uh, wants me to ask right now and make us to make adjustments is this. What urgent changes are needed? In, us, in order for us to obey God and that be an urgent priority, in order for us to see what time it is and be about our Father's business and have the favor factor and know a sinner's worth, what urgent changes are needed in us to be more like God? As I said in the prayer a little bit ago, the, the last thing you want to end up as is this, almost a Christian almost love God with all of your heart, almost fulfilled our purpose, almost made it to heaven. I don't want to look up in hell and see anybody I know, and I don't want to look up in hell because I don't want to be in hell. All right, but for the sake of this example, 
I don't want to be down there and see any of us and say, we almost made it. We were almost saved. We were almost Christians. We were almost obedient. Do you know that? Do you know what? There's no such thing as almost obedient. Say that with me. There's no such thing as almost obedient. There's no such thing, all right? Just as there's no such thing, um, there's, no, there's no such thing as the lights are almost on or it's almost dark. There is no almost in God. It's either yes or no. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, okay? We're talking about what urgent changes are needed in us, and you all need to be asking God that this morning. God, I don't want to almost make it to you. I don't want to almost be righteous. I don't want to almost fulfill my purpose. And while I still have breath in my body and free will at my disposal, I want to get this thing right now, God. I want to know what urgent changes need to be made in me right now so that I don't have to say I almost made it. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 say this. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. You see, that's what needs to be said to those that are almost fulfilling God's purpose in their life. It says that, you know what? You were running the race so well. You were coming to church, and you were loving your neighbor, and you were feeding the poor. You were doing so many things so well. You were running the race so well, but who has held you back from following the truth? And do you know who can do that? The man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. That is the only person that can make you go the way that seems right. Unless, of course, there's a false prophet or a false teacher, and I'm not a false prophet or a false teacher. That's why I preach from the Bible. I don't just stand here and talk for an hour and never reference a Bible verse at all. I'm telling you what the truth is, okay? So the only one that can make you miss the mark is you. Do we understand that? We don't want to miss the mark. We want to be counted as faithful servants, okay? We don't want to—I don't want to hear this— you were running the race so well, but who has held you back from following the truth? Or I don't want to hear this when I stand in front of God. You were almost a good and faithful servant. Almost. That word, wouldn't that word terrify you? Wouldn't that terrify you to stand in front of God and, and begin and, and eternity is, is either up or down, and you're standing before God, and he says, you were almost a good and faithful servant. After almost, uh, I think we would be in utter shock. Did you just say almost, God? I said almost. So listen, church, when's the time to deal with almost? It's right now. We deal with almost right now. We condition ourselves to be true followers of God right now. We get it right right now. We don't want to stray away from the truth because that's what it says. You are running the race so well, but who has held you back from following the truth? I prayed Psalm 23 over every single one of you, and we said that the Lord is our shepherd, and he is the way and the truth and the life. But the question that was asked was this, who has hindered you from following the truth? Man, let's continue. In order for us to live a radical life for Jesus Christ, it must be preceded by a radical death, a radical giving away of all of oneself. Now listen, religion is not radical, okay? But our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is one that can be and should be 
radical. We know Saul, before he became Paul, all right, he was radical as a sinner. And many of you were radical sinners as well, all right? Would stay up all night partying radically. Would spend money on the things that we wanted to spend it on for our own good radically. Would miss sleep, would miss meals, would miss time with family, would do all kinds of stuff against our own bodies radically. And the only way that we're going to live a life for God that is radical is that we must meet a radical death. Our old being must come to a radical end. And the word of God says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is radical. Now, you can be a Christian, or I'm sorry, you can be a churchgoer and not have a radical life for Christ. Because you might know religious things to say and religious things to do, but at the end of time, if we keep with this comfortable Christianity that is without a cross and that is without denial, then we'll hear the word almost at the end. If you're half-hearted about serving God right now, I guarantee you'll hear you almost made it. If you're half praying, half loving God, half reading your Bible, you're living a life of almost right now, so it should come as no shock when we get to the end to hear the words, you almost made it. Because you don't almost make it to heaven, you either make it or you don't. And it takes a radical life right now to make it. All right, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So in order to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, at the end, it means that we have to be doing good when? Now. Right now is the time for a radical change. You can go, to, you can belong to New Life Christian Ministries for 30 years and still miss God. It has nothing to do with coming to this church. It has everything to do with there being a radical end of yourself and a new beginning to where Christ started within you and he started living uh, within you and he gave you life and you were obedient to him. Can you say radical? The change has to be radical. You can't be half Christians. You can't be singing Waymaker, Miracle Worker uh, this morning and then cuss out the waitress at Bob Evans this afternoon. You can't do that because there's no such thing as almost saved. There's no such thing as almost spirit filled. We either have the spirit of God living on the inside of us or we don't have him at all. And I praise God that he has given me the ability to preach these words to you so that I can hear them and raise my standard as well. Because listen, the standard is Jesus Christ. He's the standard. Uh, a bum that's drunk all the time is not the standard of righteousness. So you can't go around and say, well, at least I'm not that guy. That's not the standard of righteousness. The standard of righteousness is Jesus Christ himself. And there's a huge gap between what we think is righteous and what God thinks is righteous. For the word of God says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is no good. But I'll tell you whose righteousness is good enough. It's Jesus. And that's what it means to be born again. That now my life is over. My sinful, dirty, disgusting, lustful, angry life has come to an abrupt end. And I have radically entered into new life, not waiting for heaven to experience Jesus. But I have had a radical change in my life when I was born again. If you are truly born again, there should be a radical change in your life. It's not that you just say less cuss words or you just do this sin less or do this sin less. A radical change happens to us when Jesus Christ makes us his own and comes to live inside of us. There's many things that some of us would never do in this church. 
You see, this TV behind me, it has the internet. It's got Netflix. It's got Hulu. It's got YouTube. It's got whatever you could want, okay? And, some of the, and, and this is something that we have to recognize, okay? We belong to God. And we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And if you wouldn't watch it at church, you shouldn't watch it at home either. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you wouldn't watch it here, what makes it right to watch it there? Does God not leave with you? God goes everywhere with us. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding everything. Oh, pastor, you're going too far now. Oh, that's just works. You're just talking. No, I'm not. I'm talking about righteousness. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about us being the temple of God. I'm talking about, listen, it's the things that you accept that God does not want in your life that puts you in the category of almost. Do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, that's not a sin. God understands. It's okay. Almost. I I pray that that word, that the Holy Spirit brings that word to our remembrance as we live this life out for Jesus Christ, that when we are, Lord, Holy Spirit, what's the word? Compromising. When we are compromising, that the Holy Spirit will remind us of the word, almost. Almost. Listen, the standard of righteousness is that we be just like Jesus Christ when he was on this earth. That's the standard of righteousness. Well, how can we achieve that? We achieve that by having a radical, can you say radical? By having a radical death of our old self. You've got to recognize that without God, we're no good. If we could do it alone, then there was no need for Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross. So the way that we receive the righteousness of God is that we must be born again. And what that means is this this old, fleshly, sinful nature has to die so that Christ can rise up on the inside. So that Jesus is the one that lives in us. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead becomes the one that walks with you when you go to work, at the store, at the mall. See, Jesus' desire was to be everywhere. That's why he said, it's so important that I leave, because if I don't leave, I can't send the Holy Spirit. And here's the, here's the radical truth about why. Well, first of all, God wants a bride for his son, and that's who we are as the body of Christ. But we have to recognize that Jesus wanted to multiply himself And so he needed to go away and send his spirit to live in men. For the word of God says, if a kernel of wheat abides alone, while it is alive, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it brings forth much fruit. And we are that fruit. So listen, Jesus has multiplied himself by everyone in this room if we're born again. Stop trying to be like Jesus because you can't. And just let Jesus live in you. That's the standard of righteousness. That's how we fulfill it is when we have an abrupt end of ourselves, a radical change. I don't belong to me anymore. It's Jesus living in me. So Brooke should not be married to just Damien, but Jesus. Dominic, Amaya, and Drayden should not be parented by just Damien alone, but by Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't want you to try in your own effort to be like Jesus when he has said that he would come inside of us and live and make us one with him. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. and We're going to see about this radical change and this radical statement that was made by Paul, I believe, in Galatians. This is the amplified version. And we're Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And it says this. I have been crucified with Christ. I want everyone to say that. I have been crucified with Christ. Now listen, by a show of hands, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross? Hands down. How many of you believe that the word of God is true? 
Okay. So listen to this. How many of you that are born again believe that you have been crucified with Christ? You've got to have faith to believe that. Because that's what the word is God, that's what the word of God says. So listen, this is where we're trying to get. This is the radical change that needs to happen. As much as you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, you have to also believe that your sinful nature has also been crucified. That stops so much of the drama, so much of the conflict, so much of our going after our own flesh and understanding when we recognize that the old me is dead. That's the radical change that I'm talking about. I have been crucified with Christ. So when Jesus was crucified, I was there with him by faith, and I also met the same death that he met. And the only way that I can have the life that he came to give me is that I must also experience the death I have to have had an end to myself. There must be a radical death before radical life can come. Before Jesus Christ could be raised from the dead, he had to first be crucified. And before any of you could be raised when that trumpet blows, before any of you can be raised from the ground, listen to me, you've got to die before you die. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've got to die before you die. You've got to die to your own sinful ways. You've got to die to your sinful nature because listen, listen, dead is dead. There's, you, it's either alive or dead, okay? There's no in between, okay? It's either alive or dead. So just as much as it's either heaven or hell. There's no in between, heaven or hell. And it's either this, right or almost right. We see, and what almost right is, is wrong. We just try to dress it up and say, I almost passed my test. No, you failed the test. There is no almost, okay? And Jesus Christ is desiring that we have a radical death to this flesh so that we could now enjoy a radical life in him. That is why he said, if any of us desire to be his disciples, we have to pick up our what? Crosses. The cross is an instrument of death. And he says we have to carry that thing as we follow him and deny ourselves. Amen? All right, let's finish this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. That is... In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live. Say that with me. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. I think if we would hold that as true, there's a lot of stuff we'd stop doing. There's a lot of compromises that we'd stop making if we understood that it's just not me just trying to live a good Christian life and do my best. I'm dead. I'm gone. I've been crucified with Christ, and the person that I now am is Jesus Christ living in me. All right? The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. And that means by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to uh, proclaim Galatians 2.20 over ourselves, and then I will let you go. Uh, not live your life for you, but let Jesus Christ live his life through you. So we're not trying to live our lives for God. What we're trying to do is allow God to live his life again through us. There must be a radical change. Saul was on his way to do what seemed right, and the light of God and the voice of God struck him down off his beast as he was going the way that seemed right, and he was struck blind, and after three days he regained his sight again, and God began to use him greatly 
for his own purposes, but Saul was Saul no more. Saul was Paul, all right? And there was a radical change in his life. Now listen, it wasn't the name change that did anything. And, and I think they even mean the same thing just in different uh, languages. Uh, the change wasn't about what people called him. The change was about how he now saw himself and what he called himself. Say this with me. It's all about what I say about myself. So I want you to say this with me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The reason Jesus Christ died for you was not just to free you from your sins, but to give you a new place to live, to give himself a new place to live in you. So what was once the body of sin, we were born into sin. So what once was just the body of sin by a radical transformation in God becomes a body for, that's made for righteousness now. We no longer live for ourselves because when we live for ourselves, we live in sin. For all that is in this world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes and the pride of life. But we must be led by the Spirit of God to be called the sons of God. Father, I pray for this church right now in the name of Jesus Christ that none of us would almost make it to heaven. God, fix our hearts and fix our minds on you, God. May we stop playing with the toys of the world. May we grow up in the stature and fullness of Christ Jesus himself. May we be mature saints of God. May we study to show ourselves approved. May we pray without ceasing. May we not forsake the assembling of ourselves. May we be anxious for nothing. May we recognize that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God, we don't want to almost see your face in peace. We want to see your face peace, but the decision must be made now. You ran well, but who hindered you from following the truth? So God, that means some of us are living a lie. There's some lies that are living inside of us, God. Lies of religion and lies of tradition and lies of self-righteousness and lies of, well, it doesn't take all that. God knows my heart. And that's exactly the problem. God knows your heart and that it's not his. You must surrender your life fully to God. Eternity is at stake and there are no do-overs. Today is your do-over. Today is the day of salvation. It's today. Harden not your hearts when you hear the voice of the Lord God, your Savior. If that's you today, if you need God to give you a heart adjustment, and if you desire to say, God, I don't want to almost make it. I want to surrender myself to you again, or maybe even for the first time. I want you to just raise your hands all over the building. All of you who are all in danger of almost making it. We don't want to hear you ran well, but who hindered you? So, Father, I pray for every hand that's lifted in this building right now. If someone doesn't know you as Savior, Father, I just pray this. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just want you to say this right now. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my trespasses. I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. I believe on you, Jesus. You are the Son of God. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart 
that you are who you say you are. Now forgive me of my sins and receive me as a son in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you please, would you please uh, see someone after church, someone with a badge on, see them after church and tell them that you gave your life to the Lord so that we can get some more information to you and stay in contact with you, okay? Now for the rest of you. You've already given your life to God, but you want to make sure that you've given your whole life to God. You raise your hands at this time. And just say this prayer with me. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that I would forsake myself, that I would forsake my way, even though it seems right. Lord Jesus, you saved me from my sins. Now save me from myself. I pick up my cross daily I deny myself and I follow you because if I follow you and if I make you shepherd surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's just give God some praise in this place.